This is Shanghai, a 21st century metropolis that typifies modern China. It is a glistening city with space age architecture and a population driven to build their own respective fortune. Just this city alone, one of hundreds of cities in China, has a gross domestic product larger than countries like Sweden, Norway and the United Arab Emirates. Yes, modern China has come a long way from where we left it in previous videos in this series. It is now the second largest economy in the world, and it looks poised to reclaim the title of the world's largest economy within the next century. Which is a convenient segue to note that this video is the final video in the three-part series on the economy of China. Here we will be exploring modern day China and what transformed it from a half-crippled failed state into the economic superpower that we know today. If you haven't already seen the first two videos in this series, I would encourage you to watch those as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be in order, but it is important to understand that China was once the world's most powerful economy, then it wasn't, and now it may be all over again. We were introduced to this man in the last video, Deng Xiaoping, the eventual successor of Chairman Mao, and this man is really important to understand because he epitomizes the Chinese transition from a socialist state with a centrally planned everything to the mixed market economy that we see today. Deng Xiaoping was still a devout communist who subscribed heavily to the teachings of the party and communist literature, but as with all literature, he saw compromise in the understanding of how these teachings would apply to his beloved nation. Chairman Mao was, well, let's say a bit of a stickler for the idea that all men are born equal and nobody should be better than anyone else. During the Cultural Revolution, if you were too rich or too smart or too different, you were most likely going to be labelled as a class enemy, which was really, really uh, not good. This was an effective tool for exerting the rule of the party through devout subservience under the fear of death for stepping out of line, but was really terrible for the economy. Punishments for people that went above and beyond meant that the Chinese population made being mediocre an art form, which when mixed with some failed experiments meant that the nation was struggling to feed itself and its bold industrial plans were falling behind. So a different approach was needed. Deng Xiaoping always fell on the more easygoing side of the Communist Manifesto book club. He believed that resources should still be allocated by the state, but he also believed that high-performing workers or managers should be rewarded, not executed. Crazy, I know. An important side note is that Deng Xiaoping was never actually president or chairman or any kind of head of state over China. He was the chairman of the Central Advisory Committee, which wasn't a government role, but it was an appointment inside of the Communist Party. A better way of understanding this is that Donald Trump is currently the president of the United States and a member of the Republican Party, but he is not the head of the Republican Party. A lady named Ronna McDaniel is the leader of the American Republican Party. So within the party, she technically outranks him, but he is also president and she doesn't really hold on to any position within the American government. It's all a bit weird, but even more so in the case of China, because the Chinese Communist Party is the government. So the lines are even a little bit more blurry. What this meant in reality though, was that Deng Xiaoping had more of an oversight advisory role to whoever the head of state actually was. It was a whole big thing. But anyway, what is important is that in 1976, the current head of state, Huo Gaofang, with Deng Xiaoping rolled out the Chinese Modernization Program, which had a few big initiatives to turn the Chinese economy around. The first big one was rewarding good workers with recognition and a larger allocation of government welfare, as well as rewarding managers of the factories and farms across the nation that hit or exceeded their targets. This avoided a lot of the incentives that workers and managers had to deliberately underperform in the previous system, and now, for the first time in over four decades, actually rewarded solid effort. On top of this, the plan also called for giving a lot of the process control back to the managers of these enterprises. Deng Xiaoping realized that having party officials flexing their authority over production lines of the country was counterproductive 
and decided that the factory managers and farm managers of the nation should actually be ultimately responsible for the processes within their facilities. Again, crazy, I know. This wasn't to say that party officials lost their teeth altogether though. If a facility was underperforming, then they had the authority to get involved and fix things up as they saw fit. So there was still a carrot and stick. It's just that the two were orientated in the right direction. The carrot for productiveness and the stick for laziness. Now this whole system actually got off to a bit of an unfortunate start. Despite being a much more robust economic policy than the Maoist guidelines previously in place, the rollout of the new system coincided with some of the coldest winters in Chinese history, resulting in widespread failed crops. Now this was argued by many to be the failing of the system, and hey, we should just go back and revert to everything that we were doing before. But there was a glimmer of hope in the industrial sector. In the two short years that this plan was rolled out over, the industrial output of the nation had jumped by over 30% just between the years of 1977 and 1979, which was the most drastic period of growth the country had ever witnessed. So, there was probably something to be said for this whole system. But things were about to get even crazier than that. Throughout its entire history of prosperity or oppression, China had been an economy that relied almost exclusively on its domestic market. It had been the world's largest economy up until the end of the 19th century, not because of colonialism or trade, but because it had a lot of productive people and an abundance of farmland to feed itself. It had at times been strong-armed into trading with colonial powers that were interested in its tea and spices, but that was far from the cornerstone of the national economy. The Chinese government, with the guidance of Deng Xiaoping, decided to see the potential of international trade. At this time, China was obsessed with the idea of self-sufficiency, and there was a lot of surface-level arguments that supported this ideology. China was supposedly a worker's paradise, why would they utilize labor from overseas to make things that could have otherwise been made by a Chinese worker? Likewise, why would they send something Chinese made overseas when it could have remained in China to contribute to the wealth of the nation? On top of this, China was a communist nation that found itself in an increasingly hostile world at this time. It wanted to have the security of being able to look after itself in a world that didn't really like it. These were all fair points, but Deng Xiaoping decided that the time had come where the advantages outweighed the cost. Now, the advantages of a global trade are massive to countries that can effectively engage in it. We have explored this in depth with the video on foreign exchange, but briefly, there are things that some countries will do well and some countries will do badly. If everybody tries to do the things that they are good at and bad at, well, that's okay. But it is better perhaps that everybody focuses on what they do well and just trade with the difference. At this point, China had actually become pretty good at manufacturing. Their infrastructure was okay, but their manpower was monumental. They weren't going to be building anything high tech yet, like cars or aeroplanes, but low cost, low tech manufacturing was kind of their forte. They needed to produce everything a poor nation needed which made them really good at producing cheap things. Also, ironically enough, it had become pretty terrible at farming. Things like the farming collectives, the backyard furnace experiments, and the exploding population growth meant that once ample Chinese farmland was struggling to keep up with the needs of the nation. This wasn't an open the floodgates type deal though. The Chinese government embraced international trade in a very Chinese government way only opening it up initially to areas that it classed as special economic zones. These were regions like Shenzhen, which was conveniently positioned right next to Hong Kong, which was kind of its own special economic zone at this point. It also opened it up to other areas like Guangzhou and of course Shanghai. These became areas that were still very much part of China, but were allowed certain liberties. The first of these was the fact that they were allowed ports to conduct international trade. But later these limitations got even more liberal. 
they were allowed to own private enterprise and foreign direct investments were allowed. Then people were allowed to buy real estate and foreign goods and very quickly these special economic zones started to look like every other world city in every other country around the world. And people got rich. Very rich. Which was great, but also terrible. Remember how China was a socialist nation under the rule of a communist party? Well, having a whole lot of people becoming very rich kind of went contrary to this whole deal. The rules of these special economic zones facilitated this kind of wealth, but it made people outside of these cities rightfully envious. Bizarrely enough though, this was all kind of part of the plan. Deng Xiaoping was most famously noted for saying that he wanted everybody to get rich. But for that to happen, some people were going to have to get rich first. Today, the People's Republic of China is by no stretch of the imagination a socialist state. The policies that dictated the prosperity of special economic zones have for the most part overflown into all regions in China. But that does not mean that everybody was equally blessed by these policies. China is now an economy based on services and manufacturing. Farming, which was once the foundation of this economy, is barely a side thought in China's annual output, which has caused huge divides. The cities of China were in the right place at the right time to develop in line with the world economy as it embraced globalization. Shipping containers and international trade deals were formulated as China was perfecting the art of producing what the world wanted. These policies led to the most intense period of economic development the world had ever seen. China went from a nation barely able to feed itself to the second largest economy in the world in less time than The Simpsons has been on air. China wasn't even open for trade when the first mobile phones were being sold, and now it is almost impossible to find one that wasn't made there. The wealth of this nation has been largely responsible for the greatest period in human history, as billions have been pulled out of absolute poverty and into the modern world. But that is not to say poverty still doesn't exist. Remember when some people got rich first? Well, those people weren't necessarily the smartest or the most innovative or even the hardest working. Those people were Communist Party officials that were lucky enough to be situated in these special economic zones. Today, the Chinese economy is of course a remarkable thing, but it is still, in a sense, very much a government controlled and centrally planned economy. Sure, on paper it now has entrepreneurs and independent companies, it has stock markets and super yachts, buyouts and billionaires, but it is still ultimately at the will of the government who succeeds and who doesn't. Many people are under the impression that China has achieved such economic success because their government eased control over aspects of the economy, but in reality they just changed their strategy. Today, the Chinese Communist Party has just as much influence over China as it did during the Cultural Revolution. It just so happens to be a more prosperous place because it enacted good economic ideas. It is difficult to determine where China is going, and there is no better way to embarrass an economist than to ask them to predict the future. But there are a few things that we can take away from understanding the history of its economy. For starters, it certainly has the capacity to be the world's most powerful economy. For most of recorded history, it has been. The 20th century was more of an anomaly in that sense. But if it does take the top spot, it will be a very different nation to what it was before. The country suffered under an authoritarian rule. Poor people just looking for their next meal are easy to rule over, but it can't be maintained forever. It is possible that the wealth that China has embraced may liberate it from this kind of rule, and it is equally likely that it will just continue to prosper underneath it. Realistically, we are likely to see a slowdown in the Chinese economy. 20 years before the Chinese economic miracle, there was the Japanese economic miracle, a nation that established itself as the workshop of the world that eventually transitioned into a serviced economy and then slowly into a comfortable equilibrium. The two nations are obviously very different in many regards, but oftentimes looking at history is the best way to determine the future. 
Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the latest video. I just want to say a huge thank you to our new patrons over on Patreon. As always, guys, your support continues to make this channel possible. Otherwise, if you did enjoy watching, please consider liking and subscribing. We will be hosting a YouTube live stream for the Q&A session, so you can either join us over on the second channel linked in the video description, or join our Discord server directly if you would like to participate. Thanks guys, bye.